All right, guys, welcome back to the Light It Up podcast. If you're new to this channel and you want to know everything about making money in real estate, selling sales skills, building your business or investing, then subscribe below and tap the bell for notifications so you can be the first to know what makes our great guests so successful. And we get messages from people just like you every single day. So whether you're new in the business or looking to grow, reach out. We're happy to help. All right. Kiro and I are super excited about today's super. guest. We have with us Chris Voss, author of Never Split the Difference. Kiro's got his his book right here. I, I um, Mine was in my office. I was going to grab it, but I'm glad we brought Kiro's because he's got more notes than uh, I've ever seen him take notes before. So yeah. excited to have you join us today. Thank you so much for being here. Happy to be here. Pleasure to be on with you guys. Awesome. So we've been mixing it up a little bit. Chris, why don't you give your own intro, if you don't mind? Uh, I'm a deeply flawed human. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> That's so, a great way to start. That's, he teaches that in the book, too. All right, cool. Let's keep going. <laughs> I've, I've told Kiro today I'm a little bit nervous because I know how much he uh, is a student of, of, of yours, and uh, as you can tell by his notes, but we're going to, uh, we're going to try to mix it up and make this fun today. So, yeah, it's cool. And, and I, and I got to say, if you're taking a lot of notes in the book, it's really a tribute to Tal Raz, uh, our co-writer. Guy, know guy knows how to write a book. So anybody, you pick up a business book that Tal Raz has collaborated on, it's going to be readable. And I really appreciate the fact that Tal is that good about it. Yeah. 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 Tell Chris what you told me when, I, when we were driving over here today. You said it's really all of the sales skills and things yeah. we've learned over the last couple, last 10 years it's all compiled yeah we've been in the real estate sales business i've been in the business for maybe 11 12 years john's been in the business for 15 16 years we spent thousands of thousands of dollars maybe a hundred thousand plus on real estate coaching sales coaching neuro-linguistic programming coaching you get into the business to make money you end up with like an unofficial psychology degree <laughs> of some sorts and right. it's insane how well you put all the lessons that they teach you in the years from different coaches coaches you put it in a book now the way and it's i commend you because it's like i feel like sales itself or influence is like an orchestra play, playing the whole time and it's very difficult to say hey play the trombone it's you don't get you won't understand it it's the whole orchestra at once right and my goal was to say that at the end to make you say that's right and i was gonna pick that's a win um <laughs> but but that's it's a incredible incredible how you're able to put this whole thing together and i think that's why the audience that you've probably attracted unknowingly was the real estate industry as a whole, because they try to learn this step by step. And the people who master it are the ones that take a step back and understand how the orchestra works versus focusing on the individual instrument. Yeah. 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 I agree, I agree with you completely. And uh, the real estate industry, whatever as aspect of it you're in, I mean, it's, it's tough conversations are the rule of the day. Yep. Yep. We get paid the big bucks to have these hard conversations. And interestingly, I wrote down two quotes. One, is made up one is from winston churchill it says success is going from failure to failure without losing enthusiasm and then from reading your book it just naturally wrote down i was like yes is received by going from no to no identifying what the prospect wants to say yes to and i'm like that's people get so scared to hear the no that mm -hmm. they stop going through there so i wanted to make it a little different and i was pitching it to john and we off screen i asked you if uh, you were opposed to doing it can you give me a scenario where I'm the negotiator and you are the hostage taker and we can role play it through. I want to see how you can grade me and see we can unfold it after the fact. Yeah, sure. Well, let's do 60 seconds. So she dies, shall we? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I'm the, I'm the bad guy, bank robber trapped in a bank. You're the hostage negotiator. Okay. You got me surrounded. Your job to talk me out. You got four restrictions and four restrictions only. Mm. You can't give me weapons. You can't give me drugs or alcohol. You can't give me transportation. Mm. And there's no exchange of hostages. Okay. Nobody comes in. People only come out. <sighs> My heart started pumping. All right. All right. I'm here. Let's do it. All right. Call me up. Ring, ring, ring. I need a car in 60 seconds or she dies. You need a car in 60 seconds? Or she dies. I'm sorry, but how do you expect me to do that? You put a car out front. You leave the keys in the car. You make sure there's gas in the tank. You get the SWAT guys out of the way. Now, 50 seconds. Chris, even if I wanted to do that, how am I supposed to get that done for you? I just told you. Okay, so you just told me. And the issue isn't me getting you the car and the keys in the car. 
It's about getting you out of this building alive. Yeah, in that car. You're going to put it out front. I'm going to drive away. 45 seconds. Seems like you have something to live for. Absolutely. That's why you got 45 seconds to put that car out front. It looks like you're setting me up for failure, Chris. It looks like you're setting me up for death. Why don't we take a hard look at what's really going on here? A hard look at what's going on right now? That's right. You're going to give me the car. I'm going to get out of here. You're going to save everybody's life. You're going to be the hero. Okay, and you're probably looking at me as someone who doesn't care about your life. Chris, can Point I... In fact, I know you don't care about my life. You're absolutely right. I care about everybody's life. Chris, why don't we get everybody out of I here alive? did I tell you what my name was? You know, you're very good at this. <laughs> uh, my heart is beating like crazy. Uh, all right, first of all, we'll stop right there. How much time is ticked off the clock? My guess like two is minutes, three minutes. Yeah. Yeah. More, so more me, than the 60 seconds. You got me north of 60 seconds right away. First of all, victory starts in that scenario as soon as you get north of 60 seconds. Got it. And you did a really good job. Now, you, you did fall into – Your uh, trap. There's one – in a role play, there's a little bit of, of a predictable trap here that I that we have to we have to let people know about after we do it. Hmm. And you hit me with the how question right away. Now, how is nine out of ten times actually hit me with two how questions, which is really, 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 really good. The problem with how am I supposed to do that? How do you want me to do that? Is it's so effective that typically people don't learn a lot more beyond that than they're really flummoxed when it's not. Yeah. And so you got to be prepared for the person that throws it right back at you immediately mm -hmm. how you're supposed to do it because it's so effective that people often forget the follow-up responses. Proof we of call life. it letting out know a little at a time. Mm. Like you, you don't, you don't, a lot of times people say, I used how am I supposed to do that? And it didn't work. I, I go, okay, so what happened? Well, they said they told me immediately how I was supposed to do it or they told me they didn't care. And it's not a matter of fact that it didn't work. What that reaction tells me is it works so much that they're not expected the reaction, which the other, other side is telling you that they don't care what happens to you. Now, that's more information. Yeah. It's not the diagnostic that you expected. But in point of fact, if you go from wondering to knowing, you're actually smarter. You got a better feel for who you got on the other side of the table. Yeah. Now, I threw it back at you real hard a couple of times. I could tell that it threw you off, but then you started going to other skills anyway. So you did you did a really good job. I was, I'm really impressed with how you did. I'm actually disappointed in myself because I, I literally, in anticipation for this, I had proof of life as step one. And that's something that you would have to go to almost immediately. So if we want to unpack this just so that the audience knows what we're doing or what we're talking about, um, can you walk us through what just happened? So anybody who's listening to this, like, what the hell were they just talking about? Can you unpack it for well, us? Yeah, what, what just happened was I came at you as a very demanding negotiator. And first of all, you know, just keep yourself some space, which if, if that's all you're looking for on the how am I supposed to do that, it's going to give you some space. Uh, about eight or nine times out of 10, it completely changes the dynamic, completely, right off the bat. But you still get some space on it because the other side, even, even the time that I have to take laying out to you how you're going to do it, that soaks up some of my brain power. And when the other side is an attacking negotiator, one of the things you want to do is soak up their brain power because it's going to reduce their anger and their attack. Yeah. Interesting. I'm just a demanding negotiator right off the bat. You know, Donald Trump, if you will. You know, I'm pounding on the table, kicking chairs, making a lot of noise. I want to see if I can knock you off guard, see where that's going to get me. Yeah. In point of fact, if I'm serious about what I'm asking for, there is a higher goal, which you got to later on, which is if I want a car, it's to get away and right. to live. Yeah. And you hit on that further on down the line. What, what's the higher goal? In any negotiation, at some point in time, the person on the other side of the table always wants to see a brighter future. Yeah. Somewhere down the line, we're looking for a brighter future. You're throwing that response out at me because I've already indicated it. You can't hit a pitch that hasn't been thrown. Yeah. You got to wait for that pitch to be thrown. Now, I've actually indicated it with the very first thing that I've said. So now you are going to respond. And every, every one of the skills that you use is about information gathering. It's about diagnosing what's going on. And it's about establishing rapport as soon as I'm ready to let you establish a rapport. Yeah. 
which is why one of the reasons why this whole approach is so much more efficient, even though it doesn't seem like it, because you're actually doing two to three processes simultaneously with most people you say have to toggle back and forth. Yeah. I got to develop rapport, then I got to ask questions. And since the questions I ask are intrusive and make the other side feel interrogated, it diminishes rapport. So then I got to go back to rapport. And that ends up being, you know, going back and forth between processes that ends up being very inefficient. Yeah. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to diagnose the possibility of a deal, which is also what you referred to as proof of life. Right. Which is, is there a deal and is the deal with you? Yeah. Which is not always the case. There might be a deal that might not be with you. There might not be a deal at all. Yeah. You know, in the business world, what that looks like is somebody wants free consulting. You know, they, they want to pump you for all the information they can. You know, tell me about how you do what you do. Tell me about, you know, your marketing plan. Tell me about this. Tell me about that. You know, what they're doing is just pumping you for information. It's free consulting. One of the bigger problems in the business world today. That never happens in real estate. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, I love that you said that, Chris, because it's, you have to ask those calibrated questions that you talk about, like the what and the how. So like, for example, to make it relatable to realtors who are listening to this, when someone says, hey, I want to sell my house, the first question isn't going to be, oh, okay, how much you want to sell it for? It's going to be, what makes you want to sell the house? How come you want to sell the house? Why do you want to sell the house? You want to find out what their vision is because that's going to guide their decision, which you talk about is vision determines decision. Right. So that aspect of being able to find out what's they're actually, what they're thinking about. And on top of that, there's a good way I love how you explain it so well in this book. You talk about when you ask a why question, it almost triggers someone to defend whatever you're asking. So you could ask them, hey, you know, describe the home for me. You go through that process. Well, with such a beautiful home, why, why would you want to get it? Why would you want to sell it? Now they're telling you everything that you yeah. need to be able to yeah. guide them. So, yeah. which, is, which is interesting because so, so many realtors would say, you know, newer realtors maybe would say, why would I ask them that question? Yeah. That might, that might you know, deter them from wanting to actually sell. Yeah. But instead you're flipping yeah, the switch. And the follow on too, which I can tell that, that both of you guys are already continuing to increase your skills on. It's not just asking those questions. It's actually listening to the answers. You want to condition the other side that talking to you is productive. And consequently, it's going to be productive if you actually listen. Yep. I love that. And that's where mirroring comes in. So yeah. in our world, we call it mirror and matching, right? Or we pre-approve and handle by asking questions and you call it mirror. So, and it's, it's, you're just basically giving them back what they're saying and it's an active listening exercise mm -hmm. and that lets them unfold even more. So you can get rid of assumptions that way. You can get rid of people just giving you like, you know, flat out whatever kind of smoke screens. Can you walk us through mirroring in your own words? Well, the hostage negotiator's mirror, the black swan mirror, is just repeating one to three-ish words. When you're first learning it, you learn to repeat one to three of the last words. You know, it could be one word. It's usually not more than five because then that changes it to a slightly different skill. But just repeating the words. Yeah. When you get really good at it, then you can do it in a very surgical way. You can listen to an extended thought and then there's something in the middle that you want to take them back to gently. You just remember, uh, mirror what they said in the middle of the conversation and gently takes them back and it expands it. Yeah. If you want to say, what did you mean by that? What you said three minutes ago, remember when you said blah, 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 blah. First of all, that's disruptive to them. Right. So if you just mirror that thing, you got them right back there without it being disruptive and they can jump back into the thought very easily. Yeah. Can we do a quick role play on that? Well, th we did that basically in there, right? So when we were doing the initial part, I was trying to use my, my FM voice where it's, you're displaying late, a late night. What is it? Late night late, FM yep. DJ voice. When someone's in that, speaking to you in that way, they're an authority figure. When you get pulled over by a cop, they say license and registration. They're not in a rush. They're not using an upswing. They're giving you a demand and you're going to, they're an authority, right? And then the second thing I did was I asked you a, cal a calibrated question, a how or a what probably didn't do that good of that an idea there and i tried mirroring but i did it so that was so, the first time i ever did that role play and i was so shaken by it that you got me i was like damn it i want to do it again so badly but then th that's like that pattern that you follow and you just keep doing it over and over again to get rid of that confrontation to slow it down in your process right 
Yeah, well, and see, and that was, I, now that you mentioned it, I'm, I'm glad you drew my attention to your tone of voice because I was so intent on being combative. You actually dialed me down with that voice. I didn't even notice it. Look at that. That's my own half five. Thanks, Chris. So now the this first step is going through it to determine what's really there, the meat of what you're dealing with with the situation. The second part where you go into it really is proof of life. Now, a lot of the times when you're getting the proof of life, you're asking calibrated questions for them to decide to give you proof of life. Can we right. role play that part of it? In this? Yeah. So In the, the bank robbery? Sure. Yeah. Act as if Do I succeeded. Sure. sure. Go ahead. So even if I wanted to, how do I know that the victims or the hostages are still alive? Because I'm telling you they are. And even if you told me they are, how do I convince my commander that they're alive? All right, so that's, I'll step out administratively. That's a great follow-up. That's a great follow-up because what you want to do on a how question is change it up just slightly, ask it again. Yeah. Slightly a different tone of voice. They may bat it right back at you, but then you're changing the context slightly you did a great job throwing your commander in. You could have just changed the emphasis of it. But I'm far more inclined, and I'm, and that's why I pull out administratively on it, because I was about to say, well, I'll put her on the phone, which is exactly what you want. Yeah. So that's the, the proof of life in real estate for us is pre-qualifying that person more than anything else, right? To make sure that there's actually a deal to be done with you and that they can actually make a decision to do something because it, there's something tangible there. Would you agree with that statement, Chris? Um, well, proof of life is, is yeah, it, it's critical for a whole bunch of reasons in real estate. I mean, it's, you know, and the, the other book that I've got out there specifically for real estate agents that I've done with Steve Scholl is uh, The Full Free Agent. And there's a bunch of different ways to approach that in that book, but this is a critical issue yeah. for a whole variety of reasons. You know, a concept of whether or not there's proof of life, which we also refer to as the favor of the fool, is huge for residential real estate agents because the chances, you got to know whether or not you're the favorite of the fool. Yeah. And the amount of free consulting, like, the, you know, they're going to go with the agent that their business advisor wants them to go with. But they're talking to you because they want to know everything you're going to do to make sure that the person they're going with does what you do, just in case. In, in case there's gaps in knowledge, yeah. yep. you know, the things that you know is not going to swing them to you. They want to have make sure their guy does that. Yeah. Right. And you know that sounds mean and it's it's not mean on their part because everybody assumes this is okay. It's an accepted practice across a business world. Look, you know, I want you to go with this person, but go talk to that person just to hear what they have to say. Yeah. Right. You know, that that's constant. And they don't think that they're stealing your value right and they are yeah and so understanding whether or not you're the favorite of the fool up front is the difference between struggling for the next 20 years mm. and having a much better life right now yeah and the one thing when you have established the proof of life you want to be able to create the vision of what they actually want what's it truly that they're looking for so if the guy wants to get out of there alive and by the way, the only reason I asked that follow-up question, Chris, is because you talk about corporate style negotiating, which they always blame somebody else. Yeah. That's not there. Oh, my, my CEO is going to make the decision without this person. Right, yeah. right. So I was like, all right, that's probably a good one to throw in there. But um, we see that all the time in real estate too, right? I can't make the yep. decision without my wife or I can't make the decision without my husband. Yep. So if you're not verifying what they're- Or my accountant. Are, then you're wasting your time. Right. Yeah. Uh, and then after you establish their vision, you're talking about going directly for no and the power that no has. And it's, it's interesting because every sales book you read that was written in like the 50s, the 60s, 70s, they're like seven yeses, you get a guaranteed yes after the end of it. And <laughs> it's so interesting. You seven read no's. That. No, the yeses. It's like you keep getting yeses, they're going to oh. keep saying yes after that. Yes. So get them yeah, to Yeah, they got yes. hypnotized, right? Yep. You hypnotized. Yeah. <laughs> and it's so crazy because after, we've probably made thousands of thousands of calls. And every time you're saying things that are agreeable that they'll say yes to, you'll start seeing their attitude shifts to fighting it. Yeah, they feel like you're being manipulated. But as of when you go for a no, like if you were to close for an appointment almost immediately, like a lot of times, and the, you you were extremely, extremely helpful for us in our business for prospecting expired listings. And I'll give you an example. 
Um, expired listings is someone who tried selling their house for six months, 180 days, nothing happens. It comes off the market and now a bunch of agents are calling them. It's fair game. Fair game. So everybody's calling them, giving them a call. And then you're calling them, they're pissed off. Yeah. First thing you say, it sounds like you're annoyed by all these calls. Yeah. Well, where were you when my house was on the market? This, that, and the other. Good. They go back and forth. We're not selling anymore. We're not selling anymore. Okay. Seems like you've given up on selling. No, we haven't given up. <laughs> it's like, and all that came from your book, right? Uh, nice. and, and reading those skills. And it's insane how you can see the person change when you just keep going for the no, keep going for the no, keep going for the no. So it seems like you've given up. No, we haven't given up. Okay. Well, you know, it looks like you're maybe under the impression that the last person didn't sell it, that do you think your house isn't saleable? No, I know it's saleable. Okay, great. So just when are you planning on interviewing the right agent? Never. <laughs> okay. So, you know, if I had a buyer, do I tell them not to submit? No, you can tell them to submit. And then they, they open up, they open up more and more and more. And then no gives them a false sense of control. Yeah. And the, and the issue isn't, you know, the whole concept of control. I'm, I'm, re I'm real cautious of that. The secret to gaining the upper hand in a negotiation is giving the other side the illusion of control. Yes. You know, control is, you know, the drill sergeant that orders you around where to go. Now, there's a tiny tweak between guiding someone, mm. you know, that guides you through the mountains. Like, you don't resent that person because they're guiding you. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're not controlling your every step. Yeah. There's, you know, there's an innate, deep-seated need in human beings to maintain their autonomy. You know, I heard on another podcast recently referred to as agency. Mm. You know, but you will do things that are against your interests to maintain your autonomy. You know, you kill a deal that you should make. You stop talking to somebody that you should talk to just to maintain your autonomy. We learned this the hard way in negotiations, hostage negotiations. People were getting killed on a regular basis because we were too coercive, too forceful. Mm. And then in 2002, I, you know, I stumbled over Jim Camp's book, Start With No, and in it he writes in terms of business, you know, people will die to preserve their autonomy. And this is a business context, which means, you know, you hear business people all the time. I'm going to blow this deal up. You know, I'm going to string these people along like, dude, you're hurting yourself. But it's about autonomy. And that's and that's what getting people to say no. It makes them feel safe. It makes them feel like they protected their autonomy, which consequently makes them much more open to being guided to where you want them to go. Yeah. Yeah. And you call that I forgot what you called it. It's something guided decisions or dis decision, guided decision making, or guided discovery, sorry, that's what you called it. How does someone go from, because it's, you go for a no, you get their, the false sense of control or the illusion of control, and then now they're opening up to you and you're asking calibrated questions to get them to open up more and more. Can you give an example of the importance of calibrated questions to discover more? Well, there's, there's two issues there. There's when you re get really good at this, there's what's the calibrated question driving at? Mm. And it's usually going to be a what or a how question. And it lands well with the other side. It feels very deferential. And there's great power in deference. I love the power that deference gives you, gives you the ability to influence a negotiation to guide it. Like deference is ridiculous. When you get really good at it, it's shocking what you can get away with if your approach is deferential. So those are two deferential questions. People love to be asked what to do and how to do it. People are just drawn to that. It makes them feel good. Yeah. Now, the downside is those are also exhausting questions. And it's not necessarily a downside, but you got to be aware that it takes a lot of mental energy to answer those questions. So the, what's the toggle? The toggle is the label. You could say, what do you hope to accomplish by selling the house? Hmm. That's a great what question. If they're really tired, you just do the same thing with labor. Seems like you got some things you want to accomplish by selling a house. Mm. One of those two is going to land just right. And if you're good at both of them, then you can, you, you, you smell your instinct in the moment helps you understand exactly which one to, to interact with. Yeah. Yeah. The power of labeling is insane because that's, can you share what that is in your own words? Well, a label in, in its simplest forms is just a verbal observation of an emotion or a dynamic. Seems like you've got a reason for selling your house. That's just a verbal observation of a dynamic. They're selling, selling their house. You know, you, you're drawing a distinction between labeling what they've said and labeling them as people. 
and you're labeling the emotion or the dynamic. Yeah. Now, the flexibility of labels, especially when you get really good at them, you can really dig in. You know, it's, it seems like you got some long-term goals here. Seems like you're frustrated with the current market. Seems like you've been frustrated with agents. You start throwing labels on and get really good at them. Like people on my team who are really good at this stuff better than I am, they'll go through an entire interaction and only label. Mm, interesting. And that that's, we, any one of the skills that you're, you're most likely to become addicted to when you get really good at it, labeling is, is the most flexible overall yeah. on what you could do. But it just starts out in the simplest form, making a verbal observation, it seems, it sounds, it looks, it feels, and not being afraid of what that observation is. Like if they, if you're sensing, your gut instinct is very, very good, very accurate. If you're sensing they're uncomfortable with the conversation, then the correct label would be, feels like you're uncomfortable with this conversation. Like that's the most disarming thing and people are so at saying that. There's a guy, a gentleman named Eric, has been, was studying Jim Camp extensively and then started studying me as soon as he found out I was out there. He's got an interaction where the point person for the decision maker is blowing him off. And he literally says, it feels like I'm getting blown off here. And this person was the gatekeeper. Mm. And she goes, no, 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 no. He goes, and, and I'm really surprised by that because it felt like, you know, we had a great conversation going. He ends up getting a meeting because his gut instinct picked up that he was getting blown off for whatever reason, you know, this whole control thing. She probably felt a little out of control. Yeah. And as soon as he just threw a label on a dynamic he sensed in a moment, it cleared it up. And most people would want to deny that dynamic if address that at all. And and the, the big shift is going from the denial to the simple observation. Yeah, that's great. I love that. You've worked with a lot of real estate individuals and a lot of people in sales, they want to be agreeable just to get people to like them. And they forget that they're there to, to guide more than anything else. Right. Or to solve their problems. Yeah. And they jump to the problem solving before they actually need to. It's pre probably too premature. Well, I think a lot of people try are just trying to make a commission trying to make a sale rather than looking at it as you know i can solve your problem i just need to know what the problem is yeah well chris in your experience what do you see is like the biggest struggle for overcoming when you're working with typical agents it's a tough business the turnover is high there's a lot of competition and depending upon how they've got into it they probably feel a really intense pressure for the next commission and then there's a lot of things that people could do to be successful short term that kills them long term, mm -hmm. just kills them long term. I think one of the biggest problems is yeah, I the stat that I've thrown out and nobody's contradicted me that 80 percent of buyers and sellers say that they would use the agent again. And only 20 percent of them do. Yeah. And I've heard real estate agents say, look, sometimes you got to shove them into the deal. Now you can shove them into the deal and get your commission. And they are never going to, not only are they never going to refer you, they're never going to use you again. Anytime your name comes up, you're going to get, at best, they're going to kill you by not responding. Yeah. Or they're going to go ahead and say negative things about you. When Steve and I were working on the book, The Full Fee Agent, one of the first writers that we were working with, we're laying this out to her and she says, you know, I've been on the email mailing list of this real estate agent's newsletter for eight years. And in that eight years, I've engaged in three real estate transactions, all with different agents and none with the person who's emailing me every week. <laughs> so what does that tell you? Not only was she, she's stringing everybody along and three agents, three transactions, she didn't repeat with any of them. Yeah. Cause they probably all felt like sometimes you got to push a, buyer or seller into the deal sometimes and so you get that deal and wonder why they never refer you and so understanding you know what's your best long term is don't shove anybody into a deal because you're not guiding you're not making them feel safe yeah. you know, how can you make those tiny little shifts where it feels to you like you're risking the deal and in point of fact you're building your long-term pipeline yeah i love that 
there's so many different things in terms of when you're going through a transaction or especially for realtors in communication, they need to have a diverse set of these skills. So it's acquiring the, the, the client and then being able to go through the transaction, handling certain unpredictable aspects. And this is why I have issues with certain people that say scripts are bad. S scripts is like the plan. And then you need to be able to adapt. They're equally as important. Yeah. And um, you talk about this a lot. The ad adaptability needs to be there because you have to be, you're not going to always be ready for the surprises, but you need to be able to adapt to them right away. Well, yeah. I, I, and I think you, you touch on a really critical issue. Using your scripts is food for thought, priming a pump. And I think people in my position, even on my team, and that's one thing that Steve has been really insistent, you know, that we help people with scripts. When you really get into it, you don't want to be scripted because you feel constrained. But in point of fact, if I get exposed to a new idea, I'm going to want to hear three, four examples. Mm -hmm. Now I'm priming a pump. Now I got the thought process is gone. My synaptic connections are firing. And I can come up with my, my own uh, wording in the moment. Yeah. So uh, I, I agree with you completely. I think scripting is very helpful when you're trying to learn a skill and to get the brain going. Yeah. One thing I love that you did and you were successful at accomplishing it, necessity is the mother of creation. And after a couple of the incidences that you guys had with certain deaths and, uh, you know, with negotiations, you're like, we could do better. And that's when you did the collaboration with Harvard. And then you found out there was a lot of scientific evidence that proves that what you guys were doing actually works. Right. How was it training these people before you had the scientific data to back it? Because sometimes when we're training agents to do the same things, we're like, just trust us. It works. It works. But you guys, when you got the scientific data, it's almost like it was backed by science and people believed it more. Yeah, it was much tougher in the earlier days when we didn't have that much other than anecdotal experience to back it up. Sure. Yeah. And what would typically happen is if somebody encountered a situation shortly after training where the skills were still high, they'd probably do really well. What a, what a lot of people forget, and one of the things reasons why the, the role play that you and I did just a few moments ago was so valuable, is you know emotional intelligence communication skills are as perishable as they are buildable. Mm. It's like any language, you know. Even if you're a native speaker and did some hostage negotiation training in Poland a number of years ago, one of the uh, FBI agents that went along was native-born Polish and was a native speaker, but he'd been out of Poland for years. I mean, and so we get him back in his own environment. He's a native speaker. He doesn't remember what half the words <laughs> mean. You know, so the language of negotiation, the language of communication, of emotional intelligence is perishable and, and, and you got to practice to stay sharp. Otherwise, it's going to go away. So yeah. we're training hostage negotiators. Somebody encounters a situation the following week. They're awesome. They hit it. They're perfect. If they encounter it six months later, they're really rusty. Yeah. I was, I was talking to John on the way here and I was just like, you know, this is crazy. With a lot of the skills here, they become a lifestyle if you actually want and you're actually a student of it. And I was telling yeah. John, I was like, yeah. I broke up with this girl the other day and I did an emotional anchor because she was trying to reach out to me again. And she's just like, hey, can we be friends? I said, you're going to hate me if we're friends. <laughs> and she's like, I could never hate you. I'm like, all right, it's set. Let's go. <laughs> so, so then it, like, it's pretty insane. How he'll, he'll use this on me, too, when we have like a disagreement for uh, for for work relationships or conversations it's a it becomes a lifestyle because it's something that's you can't just pick and choose when it's there it becomes ingrained in you almost in a weird way um and it's like in every aspect of your life it's there but you can also use it for good you could use it for bad and it really depends on the person's intentions no matter what a thousand percent and it should become a lifestyle because look if you want to collaborate and have a better life yep then yeah it's a lifestyle like one of the things I tell a lot of people, which is invisible, there's less friction in my life than there is in everybody around me. And that's why it's it's invisible. You know, there aren't these celebratory moments, but I'm getting everything in my life faster. And I don't mean you two guys, but I, I guarantee you, I'm getting everything in my life faster than you are. Yeah. I'm getting into my hotels faster than you are. I'm getting more late checkouts. I'm finding my lost luggage in an airport faster than you are. You know, I'm dealing with my neighbors faster than you are i'm i'm you know you know you you pick something yeah i guarantee you i'm getting it faster than you i'm i'm in i'm in uh whole foods the other day i'm getting waited on faster than you because these tiny little skills when they become a lifestyle they start eliminating the negative friction the automatic pushbacks yeah that delay you bit by bit throughout the day which is the death by a thousand cuts 
or survival by not getting a thousand cuts. Yeah. Yeah. You know, those thousand cuts just do not exist in my world. Yeah. Can you give us some of those, you know, quick examples? Like I know you did. I, I'm, I'm, I was a big fan of your master class. I think there was an example about being so generous with your time. Yeah. The label. Yeah. And, and that, and I've come to find out there are a lot of reasons why that's even more effective than I realized. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm soaking this up everywhere I can. There's a comment that Robert T Cialdini made, uh, Psychology of Influence. Robert and I were on the same panel a couple months ago, and it's better to ask, congratulate somebody on being generous and being nice. Because if they're nice, they've accomplished their mission. Mm. And they don't got to do anything else for you. But if they're generous, you know, as Andrew Huberman would say, that's more of a verb. And it encourages the continued generosity. Yeah. And so I think the first time I used it, I was on with customer service on some airline and um, she was being very short with me. And I thought in my head when she had me on hold, I could imagine her turning and looking to the other s customer service people <laughs> saying to them, this dude's lucky I'm on a phone with him at all. <laughs> I mean, that is the vibe I'm getting from her. And empathy is about how does the other side see things? Hmm. You know, when you think somebody's being stingy, what they're saying to themselves is, you're lucky I'm talking to you. Mm. So actually, from their point of view, they're being generous. Now, it doesn't matter whether or not that's accurate. Empathy is about how does the other side see things. So she comes back on the line, and the first thing I say is like, look, I appreciate you being generous with your time. I see, I feel an instant change in demeanor. Mm. And she, she talks to me for a moment, puts me back on hold. She comes back on and she's made all the changes on my flight with no further conversation and no penalty fees. Mm. <laughs> because I threw that generous out there and it's a verb and it's an encouragement of continued generosity. Yeah. Isn't it crazy how you can even feel that shift over the phone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's a lot of fun. And that's why there's less friction in my world. <laughs> <laughs> the question that comes up in my mind, just being a student, is why not use tactical empathy in that situation instead of creating a label that she has to live by moving forward? Ah, well, uh, first of all, I would say that, that that is a little bit more advanced application of empathy. Mm. So it's, it's still tactical empathy. And as you get into this and in, in, in the moment, your gut instinct is going to give you what you need to say. And I, a much longer version, well, it seems like you feel you're being very generous. Mm. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm shortening it down. I'm still staying within the discipline. I'm actually just cutting it down and I'm taking a shot every now and then. If my gut tells me it's right there, yeah. then I'll just shorten it and I'll, and I'll, and I'll throw it out there. And what I found, especially if I could step back, and that's what I did when I was on hold. I, I stepped back and I thought, what's she saying to herself right now? What's she saying to the people around her? Yeah. You know, if, if you can imagine, if your gut instinct can tell you what they're saying, and you say it, and you say it in a nice way, a playful way, anything other than an offensive way, the way it lands will be ridiculously effective, and it'll come to you in the moment. Yeah. If you've been practicing, you know, like you said, if you made it your lifestyle, if it's a way you collaborate with everybody, yeah, you'll be, you'll be amazed at, at the phrases that you come up with that suddenly put you in a different place. Yeah. And that's what happens with the F word, fair. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, I always find myself in certain negotiations where I'm like, what do I do in this? I'm like, well, it has to be fair for you, fair for me, and ultimately cause the home to sell. And it's just shifting it into like, what's the end goal? like what they want to do, not just focusing on the numbers right now, you're focusing on like the end result, which is always moving it away from monetary because people get stuck on that. And that fair term helps them, like no one wants to be unfair. So can you share? And, and here's what I love about the way you put it that way. You know, fair is fair if it's a two-way street. Yeah. And you said it has to be fair for you, it has to be fair for me. You automatically made that a two-way street. Most of the time when people drop the, the word fair in the F-bomb, it's not one way. You know, it's only fair for them. Yeah. And they can't really articulate why. They feel backed into a corner. They feel out of control. If they could articulate why, they'd tell you why. Yeah. And, but that principally is a one-way street. You know, like, and, and again, you know, I'll, 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 I'll use a, the most visible example these days. 
Donald Trump, it's one of his favorite words. Yeah. This is very unfair. Now, whether or not that's accurate, he's really only given it to you from his perspective. Yeah. And that's simply an example. But what you put up a minute ago was you made it a two-way street. Yeah. And when it's two-way, then it's actually fair. Yeah. Well, thank you for doing that. How did that come up for you in terms of actually putting this into uh, the, the black swan, like the system? What really jumped out at me a long time ago, I'm listening to a person that I admired and I still admire. And one of the nicest and best and smartest people I know. And they're talking about selling a house in a city where the market has dropped significantly. Mm. And in the midst of the negotiation, this person's got a low offer. And they say to the other side, I only want what's fair. And the other side raised their offer. And I remember hearing that thinking, how is that fair? <laughs> yeah. You know, I realize it's it's unfortunate for the seller that the market dropped. Right. But it, it's not the buyer's problem that the market dropped. The buyer's trying to come in with a price dictated by the market. And that's when I really realized, you know, first of all, the power of the word, because the seller got an instantaneous jump and and could get away with it, you know, getting the deal using the F word, because theoretically, they're never going to deal with this person again. Yeah. And a point of fact in life, one off negotiations are not the rule of the day, you're going to see the same person over and over and over again. Yeah. So you got to be careful about using this. And even if you use it, you know, what you perceive to be a one off, it's probably going to come back to bite you eventually. Yeah. I mean, it, you, you, you putting manipulative vibes into the universe is bad for karma. Yeah. yeah. But then I thought also, okay, so this is a manipulative word being used by a very good person. And what is, what's the emotional reaction? The emotional reaction is somebody who's a good person feels backed into a corner and they throw that out. And that, I remember that in that context, it's really got me thinking about the word, which is why we designated it uh, the F-bomb, the, F the F word in negotiations, because it does land. Yeah. Nobody wants to be unfair, even when it's not their fault. Yeah, so true. It's it's insane because as you're talking, I'm just like, oh, and this skill, and this skill, and this skill. I'm like, damn, I wish we had more time because there's so many things that are that are here that are so golden. You have uh, the one that I, I love really is the emotional anchoring. Uh, yeah. The emotional anchoring is so powerful. Can you share that in your own words as well? Yeah, well, you know, I don't believe, uh, and we don't do extreme anchors in negotiation. You know, I want to give you the price that I want. You know, I'm, I'm not I'm not playing games with pricing and. I realize that you're going to react to that regardless anyway. You know, I refer to it as I never throw a number out naked. Any time that I have, I've regretted it. Yeah. And so I'm going to say, look, it's a lot. I will put some sort of an emotional anchor in front of that. It's expensive or I'm cheap. Whichever way there is on that, that, I, that I'm coming. I'm, I'm going to seem like I'm cheap. I'm going to seem like I don't want to pay for anything. Yeah. I'm going to seem like I'm trying to get something for money. That's if I'm coming in at a number that I expect that you're going to want to bargain me up or flip side. I'm asking a lot. I'm expensive. I'm more than you can imagine. I'm heart stoppingly expensive because for my company, we're about delivering value. We're going to over deliver. It's going to be worth more to you if you implement our skills. So I don't want to be bothered with going back and forth on price. Yeah. That's utter waste of time. So let's get the price out of the way and let's talk about what you're getting for that price. And then if it's not worth it for you, cool. But I'm not gonna get drugged down uh, the rabbit hole of a price bargaining situation. So I'll say, look, you wanna hire me as a consultant? It's, it's expensive, don't kid yourself. It's gonna be a lot of money. You're gonna imagine a number. And then when I give you my fee, you're gonna be like, you're either gonna, one of two reactions. You're gonna appreciate that you were warned. And you're gonna say, yeah, you're right. You did tell me it was expensive. Mm. Or you're going to say, wow, wasn't as bad as I expected it to be. Either way, we're moving forward to whether or not it's going to be valuable for you. Yeah. And we're not going to get drug into this nonsensical price bargaining thing, which is a rabbit hole and a rabbit trap, which keeps you from making better deals. Yeah. Now, that's if, great. If you had to flip the roles where you're paying for something and it's being negotiated, there's a little bit of an element of there could be a consequence, right? Because if you pay too much, you might get lower than what your the, the value is. If you pay too little, they might not do nothing. It's almost like you have to hit a sweet spot in that negotiation when you're paying. How do you get to that point? Absolutely. 
Yeah, I, and I really want to hit that sweet spot because if I underpay you, you're not going to do a good job. You're going to be anxious the whole time and you're not going to want to do business with me again. If I overpay you, my expectations on my end are going to be high. I'm going to be disappointed. I'm not going to want to do business with you again. So I want to hit a number that works for both of us, that you're good with. And then we're going to talk about what is you're going to my number that I've agreed to is because I'm going to actually expect you to live up to your promise. Yeah. You know, this whole thing of under promise and over deliver. And in many cases, people over promise and under deliver. Yeah. Right. Like I'm, I'm going to feel out for with you in the subsequent process, which one of those two you are. And then if you're an over promise or if you're an under promise over deliver person, like I'm going to happily pay you what you ask. Yeah. The, the real problem, you know, people that ask for more than they would really settle for among the seasoned business peoples, they walk away from a deal that you should have made. We're in a hiring mode. We're hiring some people. I'm looking for executive assistance. You know, we say to them, look, give me a number that would make you feel good about working here. I mean, the, the real number, I want to know the real number. You know, and I don't know who trained them, but two of them came back to us with numbers that are more than I'm paying my, 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 ma my general manager. We didn't even reject it. We didn't, we just stopped talking to him entirely. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm like, all right, so somebody told you to high anchor and bargain down and meet in the middle. I asked you to give me your real number. You did not. You high anchored. And that's deceptive. Hmm. I asked you to tell me really what your number was. And you chose to, I know that ain't your number. However, you just told me that you think deception is okay as a general rule. Hmm. And that's a violation of one of my core principles. So you high anchor with me, I'm going to walk away from you. It drives deals away from the table you otherwise should have made. Yeah. I love that you said that. It's like every seller. Yeah. Right. But it's also like, think about well, it like this well, in people, terms of people have this, this mentality that, you know, if I give you a number that's too low, I can never come up. Yeah. Well, that's the, the, the meet in the middle kind of aspect that Chris is talking about. But the one thing in terms of paying for a service, I think of contractors all the time, but then you look at a contractor, they give you a quote for something, but then what's the odds of it actually getting delivered with what they're promising you. So that also goes into yes, without how is meaningless. Right. So can you elaborate on that, please? Yeah, you know, and, and that you're hitting the nail on the head. I mean, I we used to say yes without yet yeah, yes is nothing without how. Probably now more accurate, yes is nothing, period. How is everything? Mm. So let's get into how. And let's, you know, let's talk about cause cause that's a real issue. Even if you plan on over and over delivering, yeah. it's probably something that we fail to take into account. So the sooner we get into how, the sooner we find out where the problems are. You're assuming that, for example, you're going to do work on my house. You come to my house when your calendar's open. And point of fact, I travel all the time. So we got, tra we got calendar problems. You know, so let's get into the how. What are the assumptions you're making that don't match up with reality and me? What are the assumptions I'm making that don't match up with reality? Yeah. The sooner you get into how, the sooner you start to iron this stuff out. And if then if it's collaborative, then we work it out together and we both either want to do business with each other again, or I'm, I'm going to refer you to everybody. Yeah. And right. then you, the business, then I become a great referral. It becomes a very long tail in the business yeah. for you. Now I know we're running on time and we want to be respectful of your time. The one thing uh, just as we end this is that there's two parts. I forgot which book you referenced it, but there's two systems in the brain. You have the human brain that's running on emotions. That's fast to act. And then you have the logical part. And I always think of it as like a maestro holding the wand. It's like one's logical, one's emotional, one's logical, one's emotional, but the emotional ones, you can make them decide faster versus the logical ones that anchors things in. Um, can you just share a little bit more about the importance of people getting more in touch with the emotional intelligence side of it? as it's becoming more critical with our age, uh, with the technology influence right now? Yeah, really. I mean, every decision you make is made based on what you care about. Of course, you know, that seems obvious. Of course, I'm going to make decisions based on what I care about. Well, if you're willing to accept that, then that means every decision you make is has an emotional, critical emotional component element to it. And as soon as you begin to look at that and then really start to thinking about, you know, what's the difference between a like and a want and a need? 
and the likes are very surface, but the wants are what you're driving for, for your, for your long-term life. Yeah. So as soon as you can really start to focus on people's emotions, like the responses you're going to get from somebody is like, hey, you're reading my mind. Well, no, I'm just reading your emotions. Yeah. And you feel really good about it. If somebody says to you, hey, you're reading my mind. That's not a defensive thing. They love it. They love how you're reacting to it. Yeah. They love how you're anticipating. They feel looked out for. They feel like you got your back. That's what they're looking for from a trusted advisor, which is what the real estate agent is meant to be. Yeah. So start focusing on emotions and you really dial into people much faster. The logic will fall into place after that. Yeah. Awesome. Incredible. And Chris, this is uh, very grateful for you for writing this book. There's so much in here that I would love to dive into. So i hopeful maybe we can get an opportunity to do this again. Thank you so much for writing this book. Thank you for being awesome. And I will say this in conclusion. I'm grateful for your father and your mother for teaching you how to become a figure it out kind of person, because that's exactly what the FBI needed to elevate the skill set to document some stuff that's in here that can teach a lot of people um, how to do this and replicate this. So thank you again. Thank you very much. Pleasure being on with you guys today. Of Pleasure. course. And Chris, if anybody wants to, wants to reach out, um, connect with you, collaborate, hire you, what's the best way for them to, to connect? Actually, you know, subscribe to our uh, weekly newsletter, which is complimentary, concise, and usable action. Please go to our website, blackswanltd.com, B-L-A-C-K-S-W-A-N-L-T-D.com. The right-hand side, you see a, a, a tab to click on the newsletter. You can pull up back issues, subscribe, and you're going to get regular notifications on stuff we're putting out that's free and expensive or expensive. <laughs> And, uh, and we'll help you get better. Awesome. Love it. Awesome. Thank you so much.